welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. Father, thank you for the for the the joy of laughter and that you have given us comedy and you've told us that a merry heart is medicine, that it's good for us to laugh at ourselves. And Lord, I thank you for joy, that you are the master of love and romance. You made us, you put us together, you know how this thing works. So tonight, Lord, as we open the incredible book of life, the Word of God. We ask that you'd open our hearts, open our eyes, open our ear gates. Lord, if there's hardness of heart in here or hurt hearts or sensitive hearts, Lord, bruises, places where people have been hurt or broken, I just thank you for putting your divine hand on those precious hearts tonight, Lord. Mending and restoring and doing what only you can do, working wonders in the midst of brokenness and bringing forth restoration and healing. And Father, we thank you that good marriages are getting better, that broken marriages are getting healed, that no marriages, that Father, people are finding you and finding each other because that's your plan. And we give you praise and we give you honor in the mighty name of your son, Jesus. And all the saints of God said, amen. Amen. So if you are single in here and want to be married, then I've got good news for you because that is the plan of God. Marriage is God's plan. It's not man's, it's God's. He invented it. He's the divine romancer. He's the one that invented love and romance and everything else, and he is amazing. And I've got really good news if your marriage is broken or if it's hurting or if it's not what it should be or not what you want it to be. I've got even better news, and that is that God can heal and he can mend, and he can repair anything that's broken if we'll let him, because love can fix anything. And I wanted to just review just a bit, if I can find my notes, because I wanted to just share with you a little bit about what we had talked about when I had taught about marriage the first time. I don't know if any of you were here when I did the first session, my session, but I wanted to just define what marriage is. And I wanted to read that again because there's a lot of confusion about marriage today. As a matter of fact, statistics tell us that more, that less and less people are actually getting married in the United States. That people are living together because they've had a bad taste in their mouth over marriage. They've been divorced. 50% of all marriages do end in divorce in the United States. And 50% statistically of Christian marriages end in divorce, which is a horrific statement on the church because we are here and we are to reveal that Jesus Christ loves us like our marriages. We look like Jesus in our homes. We're supposed to. Jesus in the church. And we'll look at that in just a minute. But let's, let's see, how, what is God? How does, how does he define marriage? And this is what I wrote. This is my definition. It's not from Congress. It's not from the right or the left. This is just what the Word of God says. A divinely instituted lifetime covenant between one man and one woman to separate from all others and become as one for the purpose of loving, living, and creating a life and family until death parts them. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read it again because I think it's lovely. A divinely instituted lifetime covenant, marriage is a blood covenant between one man and one woman to separate from all others and become as one for the purpose of loving, living, and creating a life and a family until death parts them. And Genesis 2.23 says, and this is quoting from Adam when he prophesied, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. When he first saw Eve, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother, be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I don't believe that we understand the revelation of unity because we are fallen beings that are being restored and we are being renewed in our minds as Christians. But we have no idea what was untangled and unraveled at the fall. Because before the fall of man, when Adam and Eve had not yet sinned, they were one as the Godhead is one. 
God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, God the Father and God the Son are not jockeying for positions, are they? Have you ever seen war between the Holy Spirit, God, and Jesus? That's ridiculous, isn't it? Even the thought of it's impossible. Why? Because they're one. There is a union and a fusion and a unity there that in our finite fallen minds, we don't comprehend. We still are individuals, we are still independent, and we are still rebellious. And when you and I get born again, and my spirit and your spirit gets born afresh, rejoined to the Godhead, the Holy Spirit fuses with us, he comes in, he becomes our teacher, he, he, he's the one that saves us. He takes us out of the kingdom of darkness. He brings us into the kingdom of God. We are now in the kingdom of heaven. Even though we're still on this earth, we're in it, but we're not of it. We are new creations. Are you with me? Now we are on this journey of a lifetime until we go home to heaven, and we are learning to be transformed and to be like Jesus, because as he was in this earth, so are we. He's the head, we're the body, we are the church. He is fused with us. He is not separated from us, he's joined himself to us. Now we don't understand this because we're in this corporeal natural world and he's in heaven, it's like, well, where are you, Jesus? You seem like you're up there and I'm down here, but he says we're one. Well, in a marriage, I don't lose my identity and Jim didn't lose his identity, but when we said I do before God, we entered into a blood covenant, and at that point in time, God was present at our wedding, and he fused us together as one, and we are on this journey because marriage is not a competition. Marriage is not a war. Marriage is not even a race. Marriage is a journey of oneness and unity, learning to live together, learning to become one, learning to love, to bring forth life, and to bring forth the kingdom of heaven together as one, together, husband and wife, as Jesus Christ and the church are. And I'll prove it to you. So let's go now to Ephesians chapter 5. Now somewhere in here, I've got a set of glasses. Ah, here they are. Grandma. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5. Let's read because we're going to cover tonight the big, 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 big commandment number one. The one that if you ask everybody, what is the wife's first commandment? What is her commandment? Submit. That word. But let's read in Ephesians chapter 5 and let's look at verse 22. Actually, let's look at verse 21. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. I'd like you girls to say uh, or to take a pen if you've got a pen and, and you're marking up your Bibles. And I hope you are because it's, it's really good to make notes in your Bible. Wives, submit to your own husband. Please circle the word own husband. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Quoting back to Genesis Chapter 2, where Adam prophesied when he saw Eve. And this is a great mystery, verse 32. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we see that marriage is not just for you and I to produce life and to create a life and a family 
to bring the kingdom of heaven to rule and reign and have dominion because God said to Adam and Eve, you will be fruitful and multiply. You are to subdue and have dominion over all the earth. That was God's spoken word over humanity and he has not retracted it. Even though Adam and Eve handed title deed of this planet to Satan, and even though there was a fall, Jesus came as the last Adam and he is restoring all things. So in a Christian marriage, we see that we're not just here to enjoy life in each other, although that's an amazing part of marriage. We are here also to be a picture and a type of the church and Jesus Christ. That when you look at Jim and I, you should be able to see Jesus in the church. When you look at Dr. Becker and Henny you should, and Eleanor, you should see Jesus in the church. When you look at a married couple, you should be able to see a picture, a type, a forerunning of Jesus and the church. We are a living epistle of how much Jesus loves the church. That's a lot of responsibility, and Satan works very hard to separate Christian marriages. And it's time we got savvy and we understood what's going on, and there's more at stake than just our feelings and our lives. There are future generations at stake, and there is a world that doesn't know what God looks like or what Jesus and the church is really like. And our marriages are portraits of that. Now, I said to you at the beginning, and this is just a quick review, that when God gave Adam Eve, he had first given him creation and he named everything. His, his mind was functioning at 100%. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. We use about 7% of our brains. Can you imagine if we were functioning at full capacity? And he understood that he was alone, that there was no, nothing created on the planet that looked like him, resembled him, that had his DNA, that had his nature. And so God put him to sleep, pulled woman out of his side, and there he brought woman to man, and she became his Ezer Kenigo, or his helpmeet, which meant she was to surround the man with aid and assistance, and she was to accompany him and be his partner in life and share rule and dominion with him. Now, before the fall, there is no hierarchy of rulership. After the fall, there is. And this is where we're going tonight. Because God has put order on the earth. Like my husband says, God is the God of order. He's a God of authority. He's a God that puts the sand in the seashore. He doesn't put sand in my eye when it's in my eye. It's out of order and it brings pain to me. But when sand is at the beach, that's where it's supposed to be. God is the possessor of heaven and earth. He made this universe. He runs this universe. He owns this universe. And he made you and I, and he knows exactly how to function in a marriage. And he's written this book so that you and I can understand our creation roles. Now, it's not that women are inferior to men because we're not. We are not physically inferior, and we are not spiritually inferior, and we are not intellectually inferior. As you know, men, that little girl next to your side can give you a run for your money, and if you've got daughters, you know that they are sharp as they can be, and they can drive you and get on your last nerve. Can they not? The girls. We're wired differently. We have different roles and different functions, but we are co-equal before the throne of God. The same price that was paid for man was paid for woman. The same price. And woman pioneered sin. And woman was used by God to pioneer salvation because it was from the seed of the woman that God brought forth the Messiah. Are you with me? So God is a redemptive God and he's a restorer of God. He restores everything that has been destroyed by sin. And that's what we've got to see is that it's not that one's greater and one's less. It's that God is a God of authority and rule because he's a great king and he has a kingdom. And when I want to operate in the power of the kingdom, I need to understand that God's a God of authority. So looking at this commandment number one, now let's go back to Ephesians 5. 21, it says, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord, that's to everyone equal in the body of Christ, that I submit to you, you submit to me. But it, now it's going into the marriage, and it says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is a savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, is under his authority, so let the wife be to their own 
husbands in everything. Now, this is to your own husband. You are not under the authority of another man. You are not under the authority of all men, women. If you are married, you are under the authority of one man in your domestic authority in your home, and that is your husband. My husband pays the bills. My visa card is in his name and my name. It is not in your name. You do not pay my bills. I am not under your authority. I'm under that man's authority. He tells me what to do and how to dress, and that's how I'm going to do. It's not going to be what you tell me. It's going to be what the man of God, my husband, tells me. I'm under him. Are you with me? So before men, you start getting puffed up about having all this power. Hang on just a second because there is more responsibility. Let's talk about what submission is. Submission, well, let's talk about what it's not. It's not a loss of power. Submission is not surrender, withdrawal, or apathy. Submission does not mean inferiority because God has created us all equal in his eyes. Submit, submission is a mutual commitment and cooperation. Mutual commitment and cooperation. Godly submission is by choice, not by force. And I love what Mother Teresa says because She's gone on to be with the Lord now, but I have read her books, and she was my hero, and I studied all of her writings, and I love what she said about Jesus, because Jesus was her husband as a nun, and she said, I have a very, very demanding husband. Sometimes I wish he didn't trust me so much, but she said, submission is loving surrender, and I love that definition, loving surrender. So because marriage is not a competition, one of us doesn't win the war, and the other one is the loser, because nobody wins when just one wins. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We win in marriage when we both agree, and we both come into agreement. And anything in a marriage that is gained by the arm of the flesh and manipulation is not going to get anything from the kingdom of God, because we're two kingdoms, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of God. Kingdom of darkness, kingdom of God. Men, if you force your hand over that woman, you can get your way, but you will pay. Girls, am I right? Yeah, that's a pretty weak clap. And so that's why, girls, we got to get savvy about the plan of God. Because, you see, there's been a war, and I was in it. I was part of the Women's Live movement. I, I, I've said my husband was, was John Wayne's brother, and I was Betty Friedman's daughter. Betty Friedman started the Women's Live movement. She was a Jewish lady that rose up in Texas, and because women weren't getting equal pay for equal work, she began to stand up for women's rights. And it started then. And being a child of the 70s, I was in college in the 70s, I was one of those that burned our bras, and I marched with the Women's Live Movement, and I did all of that. So when I came to the kingdom of God, I had a lot to unlearn about this. There was a lot of things I had to crucify and put down, and I had to learn what kind of a, a woman God wanted me to be and why this was so. Because if I understand why God does certain things, I can understand how I'm supposed to behave. Because we've been taught erroneously in my generation, the boomers, we moved a lot of ancient landmarks, and we are reaping what we have sown right now. And girls, you have been sold a bill of goods that rebellion is freedom and submission is bondage because that's a lie from the pit of hell. Submission is freedom and rebellion is bondage and it will put you in a prison deeper than you can get out of. So let's see what God says about this because God's not here to boing us over the head and make us submit to a bunch of stupid men that don't care about us. That are going to cheat on you and going to run off on you and everything else. Some of you have had very bad experiences in here. But God says, no, there are eight commandments for the man. He has greater responsibility. He's to be like Jesus in the home. And woman, you are to be like church in the home, under submission to him. And so when we all do what we're supposed to do, there is this incredible picture, an incredible marriage, an incredible family, an incredible prosperity, an incredible things that just begin to come and blossom in your lives because you're doing life God's way. And God's way cannot fail. It cannot fail. 
So I have been stupid, but I'm not stupid anymore. I'm a woman of God, and God has taught me these things. So maybe you're coming out of that, of that liberal mindset like I had to. And there's some things we're going to have to crucify and put down and pick up the light of God's word. So let's talk about it. Submission. What does it mean? It means to come under the mission of another. It's a transliteration of a Latin from the Greek. Submissio. Sub means under. Messio means mission. It means to come under the mission of someone else. It's a loving surrender. It's not a war. It's not a competition. It is a loving surrender of coming under in agreement to someone else's vision, not your own. And it's pride and it's strife and contention that makes us all want to have our own way. And God says one of you is going to have to give in. But let's look at this. Submission is not by force but by choice. To come under someone else's mission, God establishes authority. There's two types of authority. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. There is inherent authority, which is God's direct authority. Inherent. God is the king. What God says goes. You don't argue with it. You don't rebel against it because he's the king, because he has the power to back it, because of who he is. That is inherent authority. Are you with me? The other type of authority is called delegated authority. It's where the one who has the authority delegates it, gives his authority to someone else. Are you with me? So there's inherent, which is God in his throne. His word is inherent authority and his delegated authority. God's indirect authority that he has appointed to flow through men and women. Let's go to Romans chapter 13 and see this in the word. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. There is no authority that exists except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Inherent authority, God, His Word. Delegated authority, who He directs and who He appoints. So there is no authority, according to the word of God in Romans chapter 13, that is not existing because of God, and it is given and appointed by God. Therefore, verse 2, whoever resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now remember I told you that God made us, he created us, and he knows how this works. Now Satan was once Lucifer. The anointed cherub that covered the throne. And Satan rebelled against God. Iniquity was found in him. And by the abundance of his trading, it says in Ezekiel chapter 28, that pride was lifted up in him. And he wanted what God had apart from God. Pride is independent, selfish desires. Pride. Independent. Selfish desires. Let me say it again. Pride. Independent selfish desires that's why it says in proverbs that through pride independent selfish desires comes all contention all strife comes from independent selfish desires at the beginning of this teaching i told you i don't think we understand the fusion of unity in the godhead are you with me because god is not independent of himself he is one and when satan rebelled against god he stepped out of God's authority and he said, I will have what God has without God. That's called rebellion. That is why submission is freedom and rebellion is bondage. It is under satanic influence and it's from the pit of hell. And he will work overtime on you women, on us women, to rebel against the authority over us. He'll work overtime on you men to rebel against the authority over you because there's different levels of authority. There's domestic authority. There is civil authority. There is spiritual authority. There is different levels of authority, but in the home, in domestic authority, God has ordained the man to be head of the house. Jim covered that last week. So we see three points from the verse we just read, that all authority is from God, that authority that exists are appointed by God, and number three, that whoever resists this authority is going to bring judgment on themselves. It's under satanic rebellion. So in other words, I cannot separate myself 
And I can't separate submission to God's inherent authority from my submission to his delegated authority. In other words, if God says, I'm in authority, he's God. And I said, you are Lord. You are Lord of my life, inherent authority. Then if he has delegated that authority to my head, my husband, I cannot separate that authority from his. Are you hearing me? But my husband's not Jesus. No, he's not. But Jesus has anointed him and appointed the man to carry the mantle of authority delegated from heaven in the home. And when I rebel against it, I bring judgment on myself. Now, no one taught us that, did they? They didn't teach us that. And we wonder why things aren't going our way. We wonder why things aren't good. We wonder why things are so hard. Could it be, girls, because we've been sold a bill of goods and Satan thinks we are stupid and that we'll listen to any snake that talks to us instead of listening to the God that made us and loves us and wants us to rule and reign with our husbands but wants it done under the authority that he's provided? Now, I know some of you have got some hard stories, so hang on. We're not done yet. God and his authority are inseparable. Submission is freedom. Rebellion is bondage. That's why it says in Ephesians chapter 5, if you'll go back there with me. And John, I don't know if you can find that verse, but if you could put it up on the, on the overhead. Verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. There is inherent, the Lord delegated my husband. So what do I submit to? Well, I submit to my husband as unto the Lord. So what does that mean? Well, there's some things we're going to talk about. How do I submit? Hmm. What do I do when I don't agree with him? What do I do when he's wrong? What do I do when the man has already betrayed a trust and now I'm supposed to come under his authority? What do I do when he can't be trusted? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? I'm glad you asked. We're going to answer those questions. Can you see that we are under authority? Women, can you see that? You know, if we lived 2,000 years ago, girls... And we were still in hand-to-hand -hand combat and wars. We would understand this a lot better. Because it was a time when it was dangerous to be a woman. It was time when a woman would be raped, she'd be killed, she'd be cut in pieces. If she didn't have someone to protect her and cover her and provide for her. She couldn't just go out and get a job. But now here we are, fast forwarding 2,000 years. We're in the modern age. We're in the 21st century. And women can do anything they want. They can pull out a 45 and shoot you in the head if they want to. They can be in war with the, with the men. But you see, it doesn't change God's order or God's creation rules. And that's where we have to be careful, girls. Yeah, I can take out a gun and I can shoot you. Because even though you may be a six foot eight man, 300 pounds, and you could take me out with just a breath, I have the power of a gun behind me and I can just kill you dead right in the head. Bam. They couldn't do that 2,000 years ago. This is still God's order. This is still God's world. He's possessor of heaven and earth. And God says, girls, I've made this planet. I've made you. I've designed you in such a way that I need you to understand. This man has been made by me to shoulder things that you are not to shoulder. To carry things you are not made to carry. To do things you were not made to do. And when you try to do them, they're going to weigh you down and they're going to overload you, and you're going to crash and burn. And I think that's why submission is such freedom. Because when you begin to understand that the man next to you, whether you trust him or not, if he's here tonight, he's making an effort. If he's listening to our voices, he's listening to the word, and he's making an effort. He's a son of God. Even if he's not saved yet, that's in the making. God loves you so much, daughter of God, that he gave you a man to stand next to you and to provide, to protect, and to cover this family with his strength, with his anointing, and with his delegated authority as a king on this earth to be over his house. And when I begin to see my husband not as a threatening lord over me, but as a beautiful, amazing son, a prince of God, that was coming into his own and beginning to walk this earth in faith and in holiness 
I began to see the hero in him, and I began to see the man of God that God was making him into. Remember, he'd been divorced three times before we got married, and I was a drug addict. So there we were, a big mess getting, coming together. So we are qualified to tell you about marriage because we know how, it, how not to make it work. But you see, when, when a woman's heart begins to turn first to her king, and she trusts her king, then she begin to trust the son that the king has put into her life and given to her. So how do I submit? Well, it says here is under the Lord. What does that mean? It means that what God has asked you to do, your husband cannot undo. What God has asked you to do as a woman of God, as a daughter of God, your husband is not allowed to undo. What God has told you and directed you to do as a woman and a daughter of God, your husband does not have the authority to undo that. You submit to your husband as unto the Lord. So if your husband's asking you to sin, the answer to that is, I can't. I'm sorry. I love you, but there's a higher authority in my life. His name is Jesus. And Acts chapter 4, verse 18 says that. When Peter and John were called by the Sanhedrin and told they cannot preach in the name of Jesus, they'd been in prison, this is what they said. In Acts 4, 18 through 20. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Verse 19. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Now you see, there's authority. There's inherent authority, God, and there's delegated authority. There's government authority that God's delegated. There's spiritual authority in the church, leaders and pastors and apostles and prophets. There is corporate authority. Your boss is your authority. There's a marketplace, school. Your teachers are your authority if you're in school. And then there's domestic authority. Your husband, there's the, the role of authority. There's the husband and the wife and the children. But God says he is the God and the king and the only king. And when any authority from government to spiritual to corporate to domestic begins to usurp the authority of God himself and goes against the word of God and asks you to do something that God would not ask you to do or says is a sin, then your answer is what Peter and John said. Do we obey man or do we obey God? Girls, you are to obey God. How do I submit? In the fear of the Lord. I submit to God, so I submit to Jim. What if Jim's screwed up? What if he's made some wrong decisions? Listen, our husbands are going to screw up. They're going to make mistakes. You're going to screw up, wife. You're going to make mistakes. But when your husband has made a wrong decision for the family, and you have prayed and you have asked God to protect your family and it's not sin. God will cover that man and God will bless you and keep you. My case in point for that is Sarah and Abraham. In Genesis, do we have time for this? Genesis chapter 20. When God told Abraham changed his name and changed Sarai's name to Sarah in chapter 18 of Genesis. And he comes to them and he says to them, you are now going to have Isaac. She's 90. He is 199. They're old. Wait, they couldn't have Isaac until they couldn't have Isaac because Isaac was needed to be a miracle child. God's making a statement. This is a miracle child. It's not going to be a miracle because of your flesh. It's going to be a miracle because you believed me and called it in. And I said it would happen. You believed it. And now here's Isaac. It's impossible for a 90-year-old to have a baby. And a a 99-year-old man who's, who's dead as a doornail, you're both dead to have a baby, but you believe me and you're in covenant together and Sarah and Abraham, you're gonna have a baby. Chapter 18. Chapter 19 is Sodom and Gomorrah, parenthesis. Now chapter 20, we go to that. So they move from the tent where God had visited them and given them the revelation and now they're traveling. Now I believe, and this is my assumption, God's turning the clock back on both of them. And Sarah is so beautiful that this king wants her. Now, she's 90 years old, and she was all dried up, so something's happening. <laughs> that's my translation. I know. That's assumption. And I'm telling you, it's my assumption. 
And Abraham journeyed from there to the south and dwelt between Kadashur and stayed in Gerir. Verse 1 of chapter 20. Now Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she's my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken. She is a man's wife. Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation? And God says, Did he not say to me, she's my sister? And she said, Even she herself said he's my brother in my integrity and in the innocence of my hands I have done this verse 6 and God said to him in a dream yes I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart for I also withheld you from sinning against me therefore I did not let you touch her now therefore restore the man's wife for he is a prophet and he will pray for you and you shall live but if you do not restore her know that you are you will surely die you and all who are yours now wait a minute wait a minute God just told the man of faith you're having a baby they leave that place they go to Gerir he says to Sarah look something's happening you are one good-looking woman he's gonna kill me because of you tell them you're my sister because you are my half-sister and she says okay okay and so he takes Sarah this king 90 years old so don't tell me something wasn't happening there and he puts her in his harem and he's about to sleep with her now excuse me but Abraham how are you gonna have a miracle child Isaac if the king from another nation a Canaanite nation is going to sleep and have intercourse with your wife and she is now fertile Hello. So was Abraham doing the right thing? The answer is no. My answer is God will back the man of God even when they're screwed up. Because what happens? Psalm 106 tells us, verse 14 and 15. Oh, I love what it says. Well, you can read it there in Genesis, but then it's, it's talked about in Psalm 105, actually. It says that God permitted no one to do them wrong. Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes, saying, do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm. I don't know about you girls, but it gives me a whole lot of faith when I'm not sure about Jim's decisions that I know God's got my back. And if he needs to go somewhere in a dream somewhere to talk to somebody about me to keep us all safe, he knows how to do that. He knows how to protect us. He knows how to keep us. He knows how to keep his wayward sons that might be afraid and they're afraid afraid for a real reason let's give them some slack this is a tough world it's a tough age it's not easy to be a man and it's not easy to be a woman but if we stay together and we believe God together and we get in our roles together then guess what I'll be protected when I submit to that man and if that man is wrong guess what I got a God that's gonna come up and say you touch her you're a dead man because the Bible says he rebuked kings for their sakes girls that's talking about Sarah that's talking about you. And he says, touch not my anointed one. That's you girls. And do my prophets no harm. Because even though Abraham was wrong, God says to Abimelech, listen, that man's a prophet. You are in error. And he needs to pray for you so that your family can be healed. So even though Abraham was wrong, God still used him to bring the plan of God and the prayer of God and dominion and God's will into the earth. What am I saying? Are our boys going to make mistakes? Oh, come on. Of course they are. But so what? It's only money. It's only this. It's only that. Let's get over it. Let's move on together. Let's get under the cover of what we need to get under. Let's let our men be men. And the more woman you are, the more man he's going to be. Not fighting, not competing, not in some kind of race or war together because it's not a war, it's not a race, it's not a competition. It is a life journey together, becoming one flesh together and contending together for the kingdom of God and calling forth those things that are not as if they were and bringing forth a godly seed for generation to generation to generation to generation. And it's going to take a woman of faith, and it's going to take a man of faith. And it's going to take forgiveness. It's going to take men sometimes saying, man, I was wrong. I'm so sorry. I made a wrong decision. Will you forgive me? You know, man, if you say that to your woman, she will melt right there in front of you. 
she will have a meltdown right there. What? You said, forgive me? You said, I'm sorry? You see, sometimes manly pride will get in the way. We know you got to have your pride. We know you're men. Ah, oh, but you're men like Jesus. You're men like Jesus now. You're princes on the earth, made after the Son of God, that the daughters of God can look up to and trust. And when you make a mistake, we don't expect you to be perfect. But when you make a mistake, you're man enough to say, I'm sorry. Next time, let's pray together on this. Next time, let's do this differently. Let's learn from this. And guess what? God will gather you up. He'll sweep it all under the thing. He'll get, he'll restore. He'll begin to take you where you're supposed to be. And it'll just be a hiccup in your life. You'll learn from it and you'll grow from it. And it'll, you'll be better than ever. Those mistakes just become places where God can teach you and you grow and you don't do it again. And you'll learn from it and you move on. You move on. So look at each other tonight, you married couples. This is all I'm going to do tonight. I'm out of time. I said, I'm only going to preach 20 minutes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Stand with me. I can't even get to commandment number two. Let him be the head of the house. Oh, I love this one. A king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in justice. Isaiah 32, where God begins to describe the son of God. Girls, you were made by God to bring out the prince. That's what God made you for, queen, princess. You're beautiful. He loves you. You may make him crazy, but that's all right. I just want you to hold each other's hand if you're married right now. Jim, can you come up here? My darling, I know you're tired. My hero. One good looking man. We're just gonna, I just want you to just turn to your husband if you're married or your wife. Just turn to them. Just turn to them right now. Just like I'm gonna turn to you. And women, I want you to just tell them, I love you. Thank you, Lord, for giving me this man. Help me to be the wife he needs me to be. Help me not to be afraid. To trust him and anoint him, Lord, on the earth. To carry your authority in our home. To be the head of our house. Back him, Lord. Teach him. Instruct him. Protect him. All of his days. In Jesus' name, amen. I just prayed for him. So girls, just look at your husband now. And you just say a few things to him just right now. Just turn. We're going to give you a minute. Man, I just want you to look at your wife and say to her, you are really cute and little. <laughs> and I am the boss. <laughs> Thanks for recognizing it. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. How about a grunt, man? That's what I like. <laughs> Here's what you say. Okay, men, repeat this. Look at your wife and say, honey. No, come on, men. Say, honey. I do make mistakes, but God backs it. Thank you for letting me be that man you want me to be. We give all the praise and glory to God. It'll be okay. He's a great man of God. You are, excuse me, say, you are a great man of God. Uh, wife, say that to your husband. You're a great man of God. You're a great man of God. Uh, thank you. Thank you. And you're a great woman of God. Thank you. And I'm tired. I'm sitting down. There's enough of this. Well, so much for romance. Pastor Dan. Hey, you guys have been wonderful tonight, and uh, the Word of God went forth. We had a great time in the Word, great time in worship and praise. Tonight, before we leave this place, I want to make sure that before you walk out of this place, get in your car and go home, I want to make sure that your heart is right with God. It would be a tragedy if we came into the house of God and had such a good time like we did, 
and didn't give you the opportunity to examine yourself. The Bible says we should examine ourselves, check ourselves out, see whether or not we're in the faith. You know, uh, there's been surveys in America asking people why they think they're going to get into heaven. I think that's a good question for us to ask ourselves tonight. Why do you think you're going to get into heaven? You don't have to answer out loud. Just answer in your heart. No one will know the answer but you and God. What makes you think you're going to heaven? Now, did you answer that because you're good? You know, a lot of people in America think that just because they're good, they get to go to heaven. When nothing could be further from the truth, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you can be good enough to get into heaven? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. You're not going to get to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I'm going to go to heaven because I really don't believe in hell. And, and I believe that all roads lead to heaven. And you just stick to your own truth and you get to go there. A lot of people in America believe that. And yet, did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can do whatever you want, just stick to your own truth, and that as long as you're true to yourself, you get to go to heaven? You know, saying all roads lead to heaven is like saying all roads lead to the moon. Listen, you can drive around the earth as long as you want. You're never going to make it to the moon. In the same way, we can't get to heaven your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. And tonight, I want to make sure you're headed for heaven and that you don't end up in hell. Now, remember, a lot of people think that there is no hell. But did you know that the Bible speaks about hell? Old and New Testament, Jesus himself spoke about hell. So it's a very real place. And just by ignoring its existence doesn't make it go away. You're going to have to deal with it. And come on tonight, let's make sure that you don't end up there. Let's make sure that you go to heaven. Jesus came, he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. It's God's heaven. We got to get there God's way. Now, sometimes people say that's good news because I was raised in church. My parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized or christened as a child. You went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. And you were born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist, Muslim, Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents tell you you're Christian, you wear religious jewelry, attend religious classes, be born in America, be baptized or christened as a child, or that because you're not some other religion that by default God lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven, denying your presence to hell. It does not work like that. Come on tonight, let's love you enough to tell you the truth, not play games. Sometimes people think, well, I'm going to go to heaven not only because when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church right now, sitting in church in front of you right now, Pastor, and doesn't that mean that I'm a Christian? I consider myself to be a Christian because I'm here in church tonight, and I believe that I'm a Christian. Well, that's great. I'm glad you're here tonight, but do you know that nowhere in the Bible say you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It doesn't work like that. That's like saying you could go sit in your garage, call yourself a car, and that makes you a car. Not going to happen. Can't just sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Sometimes people say, well, I understand that, but my last church I got involved, I helped out, sang in the choir for a number of years, carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions, taught in the Bible classes. People thought of me as a leader in that church, and I even got a membership card. That's great. I'm glad you did those things, but just could you show that to me in the Bible where it says your church involvement gets you into heaven because it doesn't work like that. God isn't looking for how much you do in church. He isn't looking for your membership card before you can enter the gates of heaven. If that's how you think you're going to get there, I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. How do we get to heaven? Ah, glad you asked the question. Because Jesus was speaking to a religious leader of his day, a guy who did a lot of good, who was raised in his church called the synagogue. He, he had memorized scripture. He could quote the scripture. He could sing the scripture. He could debate the scripture. He taught the scripture to the people. We would have thought, out of all the people out there, all the religious good people on the planet, that this guy would have been on his way to heaven. And yet, when Jesus comes to this man, this great man in Israel, and talks about the same thing that we're talking about tonight, how to get into heaven. He doesn't pat him on the back and say, hey, man, you're doing a great job. Just keep doing what you're doing, and I'll see you there. No, he doesn't say that at all. Rather, what does he say? He says, you must be born again. Now, I know when we hear that term being born again, we think about Hollywood and movies and weirdos and crazies and all that kind of stuff and what the Internet blogs and, and people have said about it and how, how terrible it is and the stigma attached to it. And yet, this is not about what society says, not about what Hollywood and movies and television and the Internet say. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, it's always meant the same thing from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. If you haven't yet done that, then I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth and not play games. You're not going to make it. 
But let's not leave you there tonight. I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three and hit my hand on this pulpit, just like this. One, two, three, bang. When you hear the sound of my hand popping together right there on that pulpit, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh Uh-huh. You might be. Let's get over that embarrassment tonight. Because think of the trade-off. A moment of possible embarrassment in a safe and friendly church service for an eternity in hell. No one would make that trade. Tonight, Come on. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? Your call, your choice. I've done my job. God's already done his job sending Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, died for our sins. And he was raised again to life so that we could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you get right with God, giving him all of your heart and all of your life tonight? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise your hand if you've never done this, never said yes to Jesus, given him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise your hand in this place? Well, if you're lukewarm in this place, what does that mean? A little in, little out, little up, little down. A little token prayer every now and again, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. You're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because in the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Graphic, gross words from the mouth of Jesus. But lukewarm people, what he just said is lukewarm people are not real Christians at all. Tonight, if I just describe the condition of your heart, come on, you need to get right with God in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family room, wherever you're at, watching by television in the foyer or in the Love Rock Cafe or online, wherever you're at all over the world, you're ready to get your hands up. God sees, God knows what's going on, and then you can click the button that says respond to God on our homepage with the blue button right next to the window. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hand on this pulpit. This is your time. This is your moment. Here we go. One, two, Three, let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. If that's you, you need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. If that's you in this place, come on, raise them up high for me. Raise them up high for me. If that's you, you know you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life. I'm just looking for you. There's a hand right over here. Where are you at? Just, they're all, everybody's pointing, but I don't see anybody. Just give me a little wave if that's you. Just a little wave. Where are you at? Anybody real quick? Need to give God all of your heart. Need to give God all of your life. I know there's a lot of people in this place that you're sitting there and you're going, man, I don't know what the person next to me is going to think. Listen, let's forget about that. It's just you and God right now. And when you stand before God in eternity, they're not going to be there judging you. No, Jesus Christ is the righteous judge. He's the one that we have to be concerned with, what he thinks. And tonight, he's asking you, will you come and give him all of your heart and all of your life? I'm going to give you another opportunity. I'm going to just take a moment, if that's you, Just consider in your heart, do I need to do this? Am I right with God? If I died tonight, would I go to heaven or hell? And then respond accordingly. If you need to give God all of your heart and all of your life, come on tonight. Just lift up your hand and let me see when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody in this place tonight? Anybody in this place tonight? You're saying, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's me. Anybody tonight? My goodness. I don't want to make you do it because that wouldn't do you any good. But I just want to give you an opportunity. If you would just take a moment and examine your heart. Where are you at with God? And if that's you, just lift your hand up. I'm going to do one last sweep and then we're going to close this up, okay? Anybody real quick need to give God all of your heart, need to give God all of your life. Just raise it up high for me. Even if you raised it and then you put it down, but you're saying, yeah, you know what? I really need to go for it. Come on, go for it right now. If that's you, let's go all out for Jesus tonight. Need to give God all of your heart, need to give God all of your life. Anybody real quick? Come on, let's just raise your hand. This is your last chance. I'm going to close it up. All right. Well, I'm going to believe God for you because I know there are some that need to give your heart and life to Jesus, but hey, you know, we love you and God loves you. Right after church service tonight, 
okay? There's going to be some prayer teams up here to pray with you, okay? Pray for healing. Pray for your marriage. And listen, if you said, I really should have done that, but I, I, I just I don't know, those prayer teams personally, privately will minister to you, pray with you, lead you in a prayer to give God all of your heart and all of your life. If you need that tonight, I want to encourage you to come and see the prayer teams afterwards. Can we stand together tonight? Now, come on, tell me the truth. Don't lie in church. Wasn't that a good word tonight? Did you guys get something from that? Pastor Deborah, that was amazing. That was just such a phenomenal word of God. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now, let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.